Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm Jackie Otero. I'm the program director for the Entertainment and Music Business Bachelor's degree programs. I'm really excited to be hosting the session with you all today. Thank you so much for coming. Today we're going to be hosting Henry Maldonado, who's the president of the Enzian Theater. This is part of our Campus conversation series where we're welcoming business leaders in the community to have you guys learn from them, be able to ask them questions. A little bit about Henry. Um, if you're not familiar with the Enzian Theater, uh, it's a local independent film house that showcases first-run independent films, and it hosts many different film-related events, um, which Full Sail is very um, involved in. Prior to joining the Enzian, Henry was vice president and general manager of WKMG, the Orlando CBS affiliate. And before that, he was vice president of audience and sales promotion at six post-Newsweek stations. Prior to that, he was the VP of programming and promotion for a television station in Detroit. He's also worked at several New York television stations as executive producer. And he was the program director for cultural affairs at a PBS station in Boston. He began his career in Boston as a producer and director, and he's a graduate of Boston University, where he majored in broadcasting and film. So he has a very diverse background in both filmmaking, management, business leadership, and television broadcasting. So we're very excited to welcome him here today. Let's give a warm welcome to Henry Maldonado. Henry, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for ha this is terrific. This is like being on The Tonight Show. Thank you for inviting <laughs> me. <laughs> um, I actually neglected to mention Henry's also on the advisory board for our entertainment business programs here at Full Sail. So he's also been involved behind the scenes with us for quite some time, helping us develop curriculum and keep the business programs cutting edge. So thank you for that, too. It's a great school. I love coming here. <laughs> So let's start at the beginning, because you have a really interesting career path. I love to hear kind of the, the various paths that people take to get to where they are today. So can we start at the beginning from when you are uh, a recent Boston University graduate? And what were your first steps to get into the industry? What were you thinking at that point, and what did you do? Well, when I originally went to Boston University, I went there because my parents made me go there to learn uh, pre-law. I never broke the news to them that we were um, that I had changed majors from pre-law to broadcasting, uh, and they were going to find out at my graduation. Thank God, not really, but the Kent State happened, the shooting, and they closed my school. So I told my parents, "You can't come to graduation." I told them I was majoring in broadcasting and film, and no offense to the poets, that was like telling your parents you're going to be a poet. They figured, you're gonna, this kid's going to starve to death. And in typical old parent fashion, they blamed each other for me <laughs> studying film. And they almost got divorced. Thank God they didn't do it during graduation because it was canceled. So there I am. I'm loose. I've got a, a degree in broadcasting and film. And I am out to work and make movies. And then I find out there are no jobs in the movie business. Uh, and there are no jobs anywhere. And I had to make a decision, well, I need a job. You know, people were getting uh, work at real estate companies. I was teaching Spanish at Berlitz at the time, and very successful. I had a whole world and a whole career ahead of me as a Spanish teacher, uh, and I was very afraid that I would be successful at it and never do film again. So I volunteered to become a teaching assistant at a school called Emerson College, and that was a school that used a lot of industry professionals to teach, um, and I was assigned to work with someone who was a local director at a local TV station, whose name is Vin DeBona, who is the guy who eventually created America's Funniest Home Videos. Uh, and within six months, he had hired me at the TV station as a film editor, uh, and all these uh, wonderful thoughts I had of a graduate degree. Psst, I had a job, who needs a degree? So uh, that's how I started, and I, I, and I, and I learned the beginning of, of the business, the real business, as a film editor at a time where in television stations, there was no videotape. Everything was shot on film. So every station had a developing lab in the basement, and they would shoot the film, uh, develop it. 15 minutes later, they would come to me where I had to have it ready in like an hour so it could make the 6 o'clock news. And it was all original film. If you made a mistake, you couldn't go back. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was my first job. Uh, and I worked really hard. And what I learned that to this day I tell people 
is in, in the film area, which, which really is my love, is the power of the cut. Because I had no choice but make cuts, so I learned how to make a point out of the, the, the montage, out of the juxtaposition of the images, and I learned how powerful a cut was. And if I made a mistake and I made the wrong cut, I made the same mistake three times, and it looked like it was style. It looked like I was doing jump cuts, like, oh my, look at it. The kids invented something new we've never seen in the news. Uh, and that was the beginning. After that, uh, I was a producer director, I worked for PBS, and somewhere along the line, somebody realized that I could talk to creative people. Uh, and so they, um, they snared me into becoming management, and for the next 30 years, I ran television stations. Uh, but I had a lot to do with their production because I knew what I was doing. How did you learn film editing? Is that something that you learned in college? You learned on the job? You know, it's really interesting. Um, you sort of learned it in college. You know, they showed you how, how you do it. They didn't teach you to understand it. Uh, and the trick in film editing is, is, is not the equipment, it's how images work together and how you make a point out of, out of uh, uh, out of putting three or four images together, it's almost like, uh, like logic. This plus this plus this plus this equals that. Uh, but I didn't learn how to physically do it. It turned out that the minute they put me in front of a machine to edit, it, I, I knew how to do it. And the reason I knew how to do it is because there is a similarity between film and music, much more be between film and music than film and, and, and anything else, and I had been playing musical instruments, the organ, the saxophone, you name it, since I was a kid. And all of a sudden, I saw that there was rhythm in what you were doing. And it, it came to me very easy. And I became really, really good at it. Uh, and everybody wanted me to edit their film, which is like a nightmare. You know, everybody has their favorite project. They're going to die. They're going to save the world, you know. And if the film works out, they get all the credit. If the film doesn't work out, who do you think they blame? Ah, oh, bad editing. So it was, it was a nightmare, but I edited so much stuff. You know what they technically call in the business crap? I, I did a lot, and so what happened, you know, there's a book, uh, I forget the name of the book. It's the one about you have to do 10,000 hours in your craft mm -hmm. to really get good at it. I did like 30,000, uh, and I became very good and very comfortable with it, uh, and, and I learned what in the end, is the basis of any communication uh, that's visual, is how you get the viewer to be on your side, how you get them to suspend disbelief, and how you spend the entire time you have them in your spell not breaking that spell. And there's a lot of things that will break that spell, a wrong move of the camera, uh, an and, and edit that all of a sudden the viewer is jarred and realizes, oh, I'm watching a movie. Uh, and, and that is the basis of all filmmaking, whether you do it on film, whether you do it on video, is how do you keep the viewer suspended and connected to your work without them at any time realizing that they're under your control. And you do that by understanding how the editing process works. And so everything you do from the shooting to, to sound, everything is to get it to that point because editing is the last thing you do. The viewer sees it after that. So that's where you put it all together. And, 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 it, and it's really a, a trick, and it's a power. And there was a movie called The, um, the Stunt Man, where there was a line where they said, if God could do the things we do, he'd be a happy man. That is very true. So what made you make the leap from more the technical side of the industry as a film editor into management? And you have, you've had a lot of prominent positions managing many television networks and stations, so was that against your will? Did they convince you to go into management and you wanted to stay technical, or how did that happen? It was, you know, it was really kind of, uh, I had like uh, uh, an epiphany. I saw something as I was getting more mature that really turned my life around, and I saw things slightly different, and it's something called money, <laughs> all right? <laughs> I realized that uh, if I kept editing for my entire life, I was going to do okay, but I wasn't going to have a great pension or any of the things that a lot of the, my bosses had. And I started really looking at that, and I realized I should get into that. There's only one other area that I had the opportunity where you make really good money, and that's in sales in television. 
So I said, okay, I'll do this. Uh, so uh, it, it, it really was, and I have to be very honest with you, uh, I, I, I somehow or other was not interested in spending the whole rest of my life you know, trying to, um, to slide by and where was I going to get money to, um, to make my next film. Uh, so I realized if I give the devil their due, I can get what I want. And I managed to produce documentaries, create new shows, do a lot of things as long as I gave them what they wanted, which was a successful station, and uh, it made money because it was successful. Uh, and I've always told people that I work with who uh, accuse me of kind of betraying my, my principles, my philosophy is if we do really well, we'll keep the suits out of our hair. Then we can do whatever we want. So if we spend 50% of the time making sure that they get what they want, we can spend the other 50% of their time doing what we want, which is exactly what we did. What was your first job in management? My first job in management, I had been a producer for PBS uh, doing children's documentaries for about three or four years. Uh, and the first management job that I had was the executive producer of the uh, GBH's children's unit, mm -hmm. uh, which was a, a sort of a hybrid. I had to check all their movies. I had to spend time trying to, to, to figure out how we were going to save what this producer did. So I was still in the creative process, but I was the executive producer. And from then on, it was really terrible. People realize that they had a guy who could sucker people like you into doing what they wanted you to do. So NBC hired me as their executive producer in New York. Then the PBS station in Boston, WGBH, they hired me back and put me in charge of all their national cultural programming. Um, and you know, by the time I was 30, uh, I was a mucky muck. Uh, and, um, but, but, Behind all of the things that I had to do to keep them off my back, I was doing to keep them off my producers and my directors back. So they could do what they really wanted to do, and they did that very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, I was hired by the Washington Post, uh, and they put me in charge of television stations, and I was the general manager. You know, I mean, and let's be honest, there was nobody above me at the station. And I was still a goofball, like I was when I was younger, except I knew what I had to do to keep everybody happy. So I had a side of me that, that worked very well with the creative types. Uh, and, uh, and we did things. We invented things. We did sitcoms at local television stations. Uh, we did a show like America's, um, what is it, uh, American Idol. In, God, when was it? In 1970-something. We did stuff in local stations that nobody ever, does be, ever did before. And they, and they all worked, you know? And I was like the creative genius, you know? And, and I will tell you right now that uh, I'm here acting like I know what I'm talking about. I don't, okay? <laughs> and if all of you want to disagree with me, please. But I will put on a good show if I play the Woody Allen Insecure card but I am totally insecure, and I have no idea what I did, what I'm doing. So I'm sort of answering questions in a truthful way, uh, but deep down inside, I have edited hundreds and hundreds, thousands of movies. I produced hundreds of films, and every time I sit in front of an editor with the footage, I say to myself, honestly, I don't know how I did the last one. I have no idea what's going on here, and I go through this horrible process that is comparable to something you don't know about. It's called the, the blank page syndrome. You don't have that anymore. But when I was younger, we had typewriters where if you made a mistake, it was horrible to correct. So you would sit in front of a typewriter not knowing how to do something because you really couldn't, you didn't have a word processor. So I get that every time. I'm having that right now. I'm supposed to edit uh, just a fun movie. My daughter got married last year. Uh, and that's what's important, last year, I still haven't done the movie about her wedding because <laughs> I'm terrified. I've done movies for a whole bunch of other people, but I was terrified when I started those too. So I'm a fake, so don't, 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 <laughs> don't, don't, don't believe that I, that I know what I'm talking about. But you might find something within my fakery that will be useful to you. <laughs> So it seems to me like you're really energized by the creative part of filmmaking and editing, yet you have this whole career as a manager Absolutely. and a director and a producer and executive. So how do you find that balance? You know, how do you keep the creative side going 
when you're in these kind of prominent management positions? It wasn't difficult for a long time uh, because a lot of the things we were doing, see, I love TV. When I was growing up, that's all I watched. I'm originally from South America. I learned English by watching I Love Lucy. And even more, another show called I Married Joan. That was really my favorite. That's how I learned the language. Uh, and so I have instinctively, honestly, what I love to do is watch movies and watch TV. I don't have this passion to make movies and make TV. So whenever I was in a position to make a decision for something the station needed to do, I always was the champion of the viewer because that's what I wanted to be. So I had the ability, which is very important to have in the end, you're making movies for other people. Although I really love movies from filmmakers who are making movies from themselves and they're just insulting us left and right. I love that. <laughs> There's a guy named Jean-Luc Godard, I don't know if you know, he's a French filmmaker. Uh, don't ever make the mistake of bringing anybody to one of his movies because what he loves to do is just totally destruct your love of movies right in front of you. And like a true man in love, you leave there after being beat up by this guy more in love with what he's doing than when you went in. Uh, so, uh, so basically, any decision that I made about what we should do, what we could do, uh, what marketing campaigns, were all designed around what is my customer at home going to perceive this. And 50% of the time, I'll be honest with you, my, my goal was how can I fool you? How can I fool you into watching something that I know is a piece of crap? How can I <laughs> sucker you into watching the six o'clock news, which is, you know, now that I'm retired and I watch it, well, I don't watch it. They're awful. <laughs> uh, so so that's, that's the answer to your question is that I was able to do things because not only did I really have a passion for the making and the process, I had a passion for that person who watches TV, you know, who watches American Idol, who watches stuff that some people consider beneath them. I love that person because I'm one of those people. So I was making decisions that a lot of the mucky mucks who really never really watched television couldn't make. And I was making them and, and they were looking at me as, like I said, you can play this part. It's great. You can be the creative nut. They used to bring me to these mucky muck meetings, okay? And while all these suits were insulting each other and fighting over how much they were going to pay, they were all being very respectful of me because I was a creative guy in, in the office. So when I started to speak, and I had no idea what I was going to say, everybody shut up and listened. And then they said, let him do it, let him do it. The trick in all of this is after you do all that is you have to make work what you said you're going to do. And for some reason or other, I was lucky enough or I understood the medium well enough that I was able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. But I still, I still, like I said, with my daughter's wedding, I still sit in front of that monitor and I have no idea how to start or where this is going. Uh, and I know that I won't be able to pull it off and I'll make this horrible video for her wedding. It's my daughter's wedding. They would, they would take a YouTube video with cats. They're fine. No, I'm sitting there agonizing over making a piece of genius. And I know that I'm not a genius and I'm not going to be able to live up to it. Okay, so I bet we've all had that feeling mm -hmm. where we have some kind of project. You have in to have that feeling. When, if you ever lose that feeling, okay, you're not a creative person. Insecurity is the biggest, ins con confidence in your insecurity is the best asset you have. If you lose that insecurity and then that confidence that you'll make it work no matter how scared you are, you're, you're losing a bit of the edge that makes what you're doing different, special. It makes it who you are. So what is your trick then in that moment when we are all feeling that insecurity and I can't do this, what have I got myself into? What then makes you take that next step and what, right. what takes you forward? Part of the fear is a defense mechanism because what you're about to do is so hard. You know, assembling all that footage, you know, uh, uh, putting it in, uh, uh, putting your first cut together, it's a lot of work. So a lot of it is you're scared of the work and a lot of the work is, and I'll tell you what you do. And, 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 and we didn't, I didn't have this ability when I was starting in broadcasting. The digital world has given you the ability for you to start assembling your material and let the material start talking back to you. 
And then all you do, like in a word processor, you move things around. You're not created from nothing into a piece of paper that you can't edit easily because you have to use whiteout and you have to get it right the first time around. You just start digging the ditch. And as you start digging the ditch, okay, it doesn't make any difference if it's good or not good. One of the things you should always remember, and I always remind myself of this, and I always forget, when it's done, when you're done, you're going to sit there and watch a movie and you're going to be really happy and you're going to watch it over and over again, which is a sin in the Catholic Church. You know, it's self-gratification. Uh, <laughs> you watch and you, and, and, and you know that you did it. You know you have, them, they have it in you to do it. You just have to get in there and just put the stuff up and start watching it and all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, I can do this and move this over there. I, I'll start with this. And, and I'll tell you the other thing that you should do. That here's my biggest, biggest defense mechanism is I watch a lot of movies. I mean, I love watching movies, and sometimes when I can't come, can't come up with an idea, I go, okay, I'm going to make this film like Memento. You know, it's a film that has nothing to do with memory, has nothing to do with, with movie pure time, but I'm going to do a movie just for the hell of it. I'm going to start with the last scene, and I'm going to end with the first scene. And you know what? All of a sudden, you can do it, and people watch the movie, they don't even know the film is backwards, because it's fine. It's a nice documentary about, about kids putting on a show. So, so Watching movies is, is like the ultimate defense mechanism. If you really can't move yourself to start, say, okay, I'm going to steal this idea, and eventually you won't, no one will notice you, st you stole it. Uh, so watch movies. It's really important. In the end, it will save your butt a thousand times. So you've led stations in lots of different cities. You've um, worked or led stations in Boston and New York and then Detroit and then here in Orlando. What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced, or what was the hardest job? Um, well, there were a lot of creative challenges, but I'll give you the challenges on the other 50%. I got hired at NBC. I show up at NBC. It was great. I had my first job at a, at a network station. I'm in New York. Um, I'm like right in Rockefeller Center. In the morning when you go to work, you walk through Rockefeller Center. You go upstairs. You go to your office and all that. It was, I was really excited. Uh, a, a guy named Fred Silverman started on the same day I started, so they gave him a tour of the station. I got to meet him and stuff. Uh, and um, within two weeks, I was told to fire every producer at the station. Every single one. Somehow or other, the mucky mucks upstairs had come up with this idea, which they used for a long time until it was declared illegal, that let's fire everybody and then hire them back as freelance producers. And we don't have to give them medical, and we don't have to do this. So, you know, like, 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 you know, like a good Nazi that I was trying to be at the time, okay, bring them all in one at a time. It started at 9 in the morning. It went until 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and every producer at that station got fired to the point that at the end of the day, you know, I felt like I had blood in my hands. Uh, my secretary came in and said, are you going to fire me too? Uh, it, it was not an easy thing, and, and, and I never had to do that ever again because I learned later on that I could fight against things like that. Just like I might have had some creative uh, clout, I also had some moral clout because at that point, I was one of them. So we were going after the same thing, and I could fight it, but I didn't at that time. It was the first time, and I'll never forget how difficult it was. Uh, and, and, and I remember going home that night uh, and you don't talk about this at home and stuff. Uh, I, I really felt like I had blood in my hands. The good thing is that we did hire everybody back. Eventually, it was declared by the National Labor Relations Board that you can't do that. So everybody got hired. And then we started making really good documentaries in, at WNBC in New York. And, and I got to send a producer to Cuba to, to interview political prisoners and stuff. So in the end, fate turned it all around and gave me a break from spending the rest of my life feeling like a really bad guy, which I was on that day, and I had no redeeming qualities at all. I did exactly what they wanted me to do, which is like the biggest sin you can commit, is just blindly go in there and execute a bunch of people who you know nothing about because they told you to do it, just because you thought, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. It's not. You can fight it. Mm -hmm. That was the toughest thing I did. You know, after that, after that, the toughest Challenges became creative. How do I convince the station? How do I convince WNBC in New York to do a special about the New York Marathon? 
uh, when there's technological at the time challenges because they couldn't get the signal from the street to the station. So we had helicopters and we shot them up to the helicopter. So we did live shows about that. Uh, again, we did a show about uh, uh, political prisoners in Cuba and we sent someone to Cuba. It was great. Uh, and and, and uh, so a lot of the challenges were how do we do, how do I convince someone? Because in the end, you do have to convince them. But they, 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 they start the discussion being on your side. The reason they won't do it has to do with things that you know exactly what they're going to be. They're going to be money. If, it, if money's not an issue and you're going to make a lot of money, you're fine. So we did, uh, what we started to do is at, at local television stations is to do talk shows, is to do fireworks, is to do the marathons and things like that. Uh, and then it got to the point, and this is where I got into trouble. And it was nothing that I did. I did and, and it was a successful thing. I convinced one of the TV stations that a local station should do a sitcom. So we did a pilot. And we were living in uh, Detroit at the time. And anybody here from Detroit? OK. It's a great town. I love that town. You know where Hamtramck is? OK. Do you rem were you around over there like in 1980? Mm, I, I don't you remember. You know, you know WDIV, right? Channel 4. I, okay, I was, I was uh, in charge of that station for a while. And we decided to do a sitcom. And the sitcom was going to be about a town called Hamtramck, which is a little town within the, the borders of Detroit, which is a Polish community. There are people in Hamtramck who don't know they're not in Poland. Cable television is in Polish. Okay, uh, and it, it, it's, a, it's a great town. And it was about uh, a Polish girl, Catholic Polish girl, marrying a non-Catholic, non-Polish guy. Uh, and at the time, uh, do you, you remember Bob Seeger? He was a rock and roller. The girl who was marrying him was the girl. Uh, and it was, it was a very nice, uh, not offensive, not deep, uh, half-hour sitcom about uh, a Polish family who's very Catholic and have a picture of the Pope in their living room and stuff like that. All the, all the Catholic jokes, you know, were in there. Uh, and what happened was, Somehow or other, in the making of that show, the Catholic Church, which was very powerful in Detroit, decided we were insulting the Catholic Church and that we were making fun of the Pope. We weren't making fun of the Pope. Before they started eating, they would say hello to the Pope. That was the joke. And, and, and not only that, but the, 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 the night the show came out, the next day the headlines in the paper is that we had a show with Cosby numbers. That means something different these days. But in those <laughs> days, it meant in those days it meant it was a hit show. But with, before the end of the day was over, the Catholic Church and the Cardinal or Archbishop had ordered us to show up, and all of a sudden it became a big to do. I was I was uh, the story was covered in the Wall Street Journal. I was being like you know just totally totally devastated by the by the media because we had a hit show which is very confusing. You have a show that got great numbers. They were going to make a lot of money off of this if we turned it into a series. And we were all, they were all struggling to bury it because the easiest way to get past all these people was to forget about it. And that was a very, very difficult time. Now, does the backlash end up helping you uh, get the show more publicity? And no, no, no. This is before they understood that. Yeah. Okay, There was a time in the world where bad publicity was bad publicity. You know, you didn't want bad publicity. It's not like we now know, you know, the way that Donald Trump is really manipulating all of us by getting bad publicity. Uh, so, so, no, it didn't help us. The show was buried, and it sort of lives uh, in, in the dead pool of the newspapers there. You know, so when I die, that will be my legacy in Detroit, the man who brought us Hamtramck. So bring us into the point where you come to Florida and tell us what you come here for, because you had kind of an interesting role yeah. in turning around some Well, some one of the things that, um, at the Washington Post, which is a great, great company, you know, uh, for someone my age, the defining factor for all of us in the media, young people, was uh, the Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein, the guys who wrote All the President's Men. Well, those guys worked for the Washington Post. And I'm hired by the Washington Post. I'm working for the Washington Post. I have the ability to steal their thunder when I go to a place like this. I work for the company that, you know, where Woodward and Bernstein worked. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that happened to me is that I was so capable at, 
this is, this is, I don't mean this in a mean way, but at being devious, that um, I became good at turning bad television stations into good television stations. And bad and good in, in the terms of the company. Uh, a, a, a station that, that, that was not making a profit to a station that made a profit. So uh, we did that in Detroit. DIV became the lead station in Detroit. Carmen Harlan, everything else. So um, there was a station that we took over here, uh, WKMG. Uh, it used to be, it had 10 different names. Uh, I forget what they were. Uh, and at the time, I was in charge of all the stations uh, of the Washington Post. So I, would, I had a wonderful life. I would go from one market, one city to another, they would call a meeting and they would believe everything I told them. Uh, and uh, I would move on and it was great. Uh, so one day they'd say, can you go down to Orlando and run the station there for a while until we get someone to become the vice president and general manager? And of course, you know, I'm, I'm with the Washington Post. You can, you can make me parachute behind enemy lines. I know I'm going to be okay. So they send me down here uh, and like one month, two months, three months, four months later, they finally say, you know, you're doing a good job. Why don't you stay there and run the station? At, at that time, I'm thinking, wait a second. This is like Florida, right? This is sun, and Daytona's not far away, and we just have horrendous winters in Detroit as much as I loved it. I figured, I called my wife up, and I said, how would you like to move to Florida? Well, the answer was no, which should... Really, you should, you should get to know the fact that Detroit is a wonderful place to live. It's just delightful, and it's having problems, but that town is going to come around, and it was wonderful to live there. She didn't want to move, and I said to her, look, I was like, I don't know, 50? I forget how old I was. I said, we're all going to end up in Florida one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go there while somebody wants to pay for it. And not only wants to pay for it, I already worked for the company, so they had to treat me really well. So talk about a golden parachute. I had a... I had a golden stagecoach to move to Florida. So I moved down here, and I spent eight very nice years doing some very interesting things at, at, at WKMG. And the station was coming around. We won the 11, we won this and all that. Uh, it's, it's, and, and it's not because I left, uh, but it's kind of slid back. Uh, so that's how I ended up here. And later on, years later, I was talking to somebody, just out of curiosity, who had turned down the job that I got. And I said, how come you turned it down? It's such a great town, you know? It's, it's, you can be in Miami if you want to, but you don't have to be there with all that commotion. And they said, wait a second. Nobody ever told you that they offered that job like to dozens of people and nobody wanted it because it was a suicide mission. They were afraid of coming to this station was going to be such a step back. And when they failed, they were not going to be able to move up in markets, which is just what you do in TV. They were going to have to go get a job in Schenectady or something like that. And, and I kept thinking the opposite. I kept thinking, I'm going to a station that is so far awful that there's no way it can get worse. <laughs> I'm going to be a hero. And it turned out to be not totally untrue. And that's how I ended up here. And then I had this, this thing in my mind, okay, very unfair, and I always apologize if I'm talking to anybody of that age group, and I don't think I am, that when you turn 60, you only have 10 good years left. I'm 66, I've only got four, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I had this thing that I wanted to see if I could pull off retiring at 60 because I really wanted to go back make, to make movies, you know, and make them not because I needed the money, but just to be able to play with what used to be called the plastic, with the play with, with, with what it was and, and see what I could do, and to make films for art groups who cannot afford it and make films that were really professional and stuff like that. So at 60, I turned 60 in 2009, uh, well, I had tried to quit, warn them that I was going to retire. And what they would do is they would send the president down there to take me out to dinner. And the last time I said I was, well, the next to last time I said I was going to leave at 60, he came down, he stays at the Ritz. It's a very nice life, okay? If you, if, you, if you manage to pull off what I did. They don't know how to stay at anything but a Ritz. I can't stay at a Ritz, but that's what they do. So he comes down immediately to, to, to talk me out of it. It's Valentine's Day, okay? 
you know, no matter how long you've been married, you know, you pretend that that's an important date, even though it isn't. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we're going, and not only that, but you can't get a reservation for Valentine's Day on Valentine's Day. But this guy, some people in media feel like they have a power that's bigger than a president. Uh, and so he came down and he said, come on, come down. It's, uh, we'll, let's have dinner. Let's talk about it. And I go, Alan, it's, 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 it's Valentine's Day. Even at the hotel you're staying at, you won't be able to get a reservation. <laughs> That's how they talk. They, they, they do a lot of grouchies. <laughs> and you, it's like a little kid who's like two years old. The only the parents know what they're saying. I knew <laughs> what he was saying. And I have to tell my wife, I, I'm, we can't go out to dinner. I have to go and, and meet Alan at the Ritz. And she goes, fine. And I tell her, I'm going to stick to my guns, guns that I'm retiring at 60, and I'm not. Okay, so I go down there, and guess what? We can't get a reservation at the hotel restaurant. We end up on Valentine's Day eating at the bar at the Ritz. And he is a great salesman. He convinces me that what I really want to do is not retire. What I really want to do, get this, is go to Paris on vacation. <laughs> okay, I, have, I, I don't mind going to Paris, but I don't remember ever making that a destination. I had a whole <laughs> bunch of other places I wanted to, that were exotic, you know, but Paris was like, it wasn't on my radar. And he, he talked me into it, and I get in the car and I call my wife, and the first thing she says to me is, did you tell him you're retiring? I go, no, no, we're going to Paris. <laughs> By the time I got home, all sanity that I had had come back to me, listen, the one thing about this job is that the stress is tremendous and the risks that you take on a daily basis are at the level of like, you know, the FCC, the federal government. So every vacation I ever have had, starting with like day one in TV, started or somewhere in the middle, there was always a phone call that ruined everything. It was be the show is due next week and you have to get back to somebody suing us and we're going to lose our license. So vacations were never a factor for me. My life was enjoying my work and forcing myself to pretend I was going on vacation. So going to Paris when I finally got home was so meaningless that eventually the next time, I, I was trying to figure out how do you quit with these people who really value you, honestly value you, and will do anything to keep you, and they're really very nice. How do you get them to let you quit? And so instead of telling them I was quitting, I wrote the president, a good friend of mine, a letter, not telling him I wanted to quit, but asking me to help me retire so I could go back to making movies, and he could not say no to that. So he helped me retire. So. so now that we've kind of gone through everything that you've done up until retirement, now we can actually get to your current position. Yes. Because you seem to stay very busy in your retirement. I do, you know. <laughs> uh, and I'm wasting the 10 years between 60 and 70. You know, when I get a break, I'm going to be 70, you know, and not have a good back, and all sorts of things will happen then. Uh, when I retired, the day after it was announced, my friends who owned the uh, NZN Theater took me out to dinner and asked me, would I be president? Okay, I'm a retired guy, right? What could be nicer than being president you know, of a movie theater? And they're not wrong, okay? Great restaurant, great bar, great movies. But at the time, as everything in my life, uh, it wasn't being run as well as it could be. So they needed someone to come in with good ideas. And I said to them, okay, I'll do it, you know, as long as I get free movies, as long as I don't have to work too hard, and most importantly, as long as I don't have to be the bad guy. Because this business about firing everybody, which was my introduction to management, versions of that happened on and on and on throughout my whole career. So I said, I'm tired of being the bad guy. So I said, no problem, you can do whatever you want. You can work as little as you want, as much as you want, Okay, so I, I, I say yes. Within three months, I had to fire like 10 people at NCN. I'm exaggerating, maybe it was five, but it felt like 50. You must have been good at it by that point, though. Well, 
<laughs> I, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something that I discovered early on about firing people, uh, which is, you know, whether you're doing it for the good or for the bad, you, you have to be sensitive and you have to be uh, respectful of the people you're firing because you're going to do something terrible to their lives. And most people, when they're going to fire someone, they'll go through this song and dance about the economy, or they'll go through a, you know, they'll give you 50,000 reasons why things aren't good. And you know what this person you're talking to for 10, 20 minutes while you're doing that song and dance is thinking, is he firing me? Is he going to fire me? I mean, they're panicking. I, 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 I have always demanded of people who were in positions working for me who did that, don't, don't do that to them, okay? You start off by saying, you can use whatever word you want, but right away telling them their position is gone. You start with that and you spend the latter part of the conversation trying to help them get another job. You don't waste your time for 20 minutes trying to make yourself feel justified and then you drop the bombshell. You do it the other way. You drop the bomb and then you spend the rest of the conversation. So, uh, so I, I am good at it because I, I could see it from their point of view. For the whole time, I'm telling you the economy's bad. The station's not doing good. What do you think they're thinking? They're not thinking the, the economy's bad. They're not thinking the, uh, the station's not doing good. They're thinking, I'm getting fired, and he's not telling me. <laughs> so uh, I, I did become good at it, and, and I, I did get rid of some people at NZN who were not, everything you do in life has art to it. You have to be very, very aware that if you do it from an artist's perspective, it doesn't matter whether you're in the air conditioning business or you're making movies or you're running a, a theater. It is an art, and you take it as art. And the art of showing movies is a craft in and of itself on top of the movies that you're showing. The art of running Enzian doesn't come from the films we show. That's the vehicle. The art of running Enzian is doing things at Enzian that make you fall in love with the theater, that make you want to come to the theater, that make you feel like Enzian is really special, it's really different. You, you, you work really hard at creating a context so when you go see a movie that you love, I, Enzian, gets a piece of the credit no matter whether the movie is uh, a fun movie or a goofy movie, and we do all of those. But in the end, what we have managed to do in the last six, seven years is do things that movie theaters tend not to do and other industries have done, okay? I mean, uh, as much as I hate to say it and hate them as much as you will, somebody invented the Starbucks phenomenon, okay? I mean, this is a coffee place. Why are you paying six bucks for a cup of coffee? Or even better, why are you doing your homework at a joint like this? Even better, why are you having meetings you know, with all your friends? Because they realize that people who go to places like Starbucks, as much as they like the coffee, they don't go there because of the coffee. They go there because this has become, and this is the term they use, a third place. Home, work, Starbucks. Okay. That's the way life is perceived by the executives at Starbucks, and they have managed to pull that off very well because every morning a whole bunch of you go to Starbucks and you pay four or five bucks for a cup of coffee. And we have nothing. When I have nothing to do at Enzian now, okay, because the place is running really well, I don't have to be there. Uh, you know what I do? I have a meeting at 9 in the morning and I have a meeting at 10. And I live in the land. I'm not driving back to the land to waste three hours. You know what I do? I go to Starbucks. I do. I go to Starbucks. I play with my phone, and nobody's looking like I'm in, you know, what other place can a, can a kind of terrorist, degenerate-looking guy like me <laughs> hang around and not make everybody else nervous, okay? <laughs> Starbucks! <laughs> they invented it. And, and, and that's what you, that is where business is going these days. It's very important. Uh, and Amazon has realized that customer service, the treatment of your customers, the affection that your customers have for your service, that's really the part of your job that's important. We can all sell crap. We can all do a lot of the stuff that Amazon is doing very aggressively, 
But what they've done, have you, if you, have you ever called Amazon with a problem? Two seconds into it, they're ready to give you their money back, your money back. I didn't get a package once, and I called them up, and it wasn't even a minute they had given me a, a credit, and I said, thank you very much. I had gotten to it two days later, earlier. I had put it in my car. I'd forgotten I had it. <laughs> and I was so respectful of them, I actually called them up and told them I found it, and could they take my credit back? That's the kind of customers and relationships you want to have. A long, long time ago, uh, when I was in college, uh, if you ever went to a bookstore uh, in New York, with an accent of a New Yorker, they would say to you, hey, are you going to buy it or are you going to read it? <laughs> OK, I'm going to buy it, you know? <laughs> then somebody discovered the affection people have for paperbacks. Every, every college student had a paperback in their back pocket. Everywhere they went, people were reading paperbacks. So I forget what the name of the company was. It wasn't Barnes & Noble. They may not even be around. But they started something saying their bookstore was dedicated to the fine art of browsing. Not selling you books, making you have the ability to come to my bookstore, have a chair, and read the book. And you know what? It worked. People loved going there. People would go there and sample books. And you know what they would do after they sampled three, four chapters? They would buy the book. So I wanted Enzian to have that quality uh, that you had an an affection. It, it was very important to me. There's, there's a level where there is like, and then right underneath, not that far away, is love. Okay? And I wanted to move people from this level to this level. And part of the trick to doing that, you have to be good, you have to be worthy of love, you have to give them things that, 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 that answer some of the questions they're looking uh, for uh, in, in, in their life and, and, and comfort. Uh, but you also have to give them permission to fall in love. It's really interesting. You have to tell them that it's okay to actually love Enzian. And we started doing that. Uh, if you've been to the Enzian, uh, you know that I do a three minute trailer before. It's a little video thing where I, a lot of the language that I use is really getting people to use that language when they talk about Enzian. Not I like Enzian, I love Enzian. Not it's a cool place, but it's a treasure. And we are, we really are all those things. But I needed to put that kind of language into people's heads that you could fall in love with a building. Uh, and so that was the first goal that I had. And then the second goal was to come up with a whole bunch of other reasons to go beyond just seeing the main film. We do classic films on Saturday morning. We do really well. Uh, we do uh, the Wednesday night picture shows. If you've never been to that, go. It's a free film. It's, it's shown outside, and it's like happy hour. It's great. Um, so, so we do a lot of things, and the last thing I wanted to do, and th they fought me on this a lot, I wanted to start drawing kids into the Enzian. And a lot of the uh, advisory council kept telling me, we don't want kids. You know, it's... You, you might not know this, but there's a lot of people in Florida who hate kids. <laughs> there are neighborhoods in Florida where they don't even allow kids, okay? And if you dare bring somebody's grandchild, they, it's, it's like they report you to, you know, the home office police or whatever they do. So I was thought that Enzian was a place for adults. We showed movies that were not for kids, and the last thing they wanted to do like their neighborhood, and see a bunch of kids. Guys, we have a theater full of kids once a month. It is the, it is the most rewarding experience because, and like everything I do, there's a devious side to this. Um, I really wanted them to experience going to the movies that was different than going to Regal. There's nothing wrong with going to Regal. It's fine. You get to see the movie. It's fine. But walking into Regal, it's like walking into a subway station, eating the food they sell there. I mean, you ever get a pretzel at the Regal? You pick it up, and it just kind of folds over. <laughs> uh, 
so there were a lot of customer things that weren't happening. And because you love those movies so much and because they have the big screens and everything, you, you kept going there. But I don't know anybody who says that they have an affection to the theater. Uh, so we do something called peanut butter matinee. And when I was younger, uh, it was the end of the neighborhood theaters. Um, and they would have raffles at the theaters. You would win things before the, before the show. Somebody would come out. And I won an erector set. OK? Now, does anybody know what an erector set is? OK. Now, these days, uh, you have, um, what are those brick things that you, OK, you have Legos. That's, that's basically an erector set. But when I was a kid, an erector set was this big thing full of things that would kill a kid. OK? <laughs> they were all like metal strips for you to build houses with and tons and tons of little bolts and little nuts. I mean, the kind of thing that these, you know, this day would, you know, would be illegal. It would be, you know how it says, you know, may contain small parts, you know? This was all small parts. I won one of those, and I loved it. So, so I started doing a, a, a kid's matinee that did that. Before we start the movie, I, I spend the, the week before that buying things for the kids, and it's really great. I'm buying stuff that, you know, People would laugh at me if I came home with a yo-yo, you know, or stuff like that. My wife would laugh at me. Well, now I come home with a yo-yo, and I come home with two yo-yos, one for the kids and one for me. And my wife does, realizes, oh, he's been buying stuff for the kids. So we have a raffle. Uh, I talk a little bit about the movie, just one factor. I, I used to be in children's television, and I know you can't give a lot of, a lot of um, information to, to kids. So uh, in E.T., for example, sold out house. It was great. Uh, and I wanted to... Uh, explain to them that Spielberg wanted to make the movie so it felt like it was being seen from the eyes of a child. And so you ask, well, how do you do that with a movie? And then I got on my knees and I showed you, put the camera low. They got it right away. That's all. That's all they remember. But forever and a day, they're going to remember their Enzian experience. They're going to talk to their kids about, like I'm talking to you, about the prizes. And then, when the, and then we show you this great movie. And when the movie's over and the doors open up and you are a 10-year-old, 6-year-old, and you're leaving the theater, there are tons of balloons waiting for you as you open the door and you leave the theater. It's magic, OK? Uh, and, and, and so, so th this, this business about having an affection for the theater, you have no idea how grateful parents are to me that we do this. Uh, we get more adults at the kids' matinees than kids. <laughs> and it's not because adults want to come, but the, uh, the, they bring a child, and the parents want to come because they want to enjoy the magic. And then they invite the grandparents. So for every child, there's at least two to four adults that are paying to get in. And they are also the kind of customers that would come to the primetime movies because there is a period in life you're in one of your periods in life where you don't watch news or anything. And, and we, statistically, we know that you've disappeared and we're not, we, don't even, we, we aren't even trying to get you because we know you'll eventually come back. When you go into your 30s, 40s, whatever, you'll be afraid the world's going to end and there's only one person who can tell you the world's going to end and that's the anchor man at Channel 4. Uh, <laughs> but in between, you're having a good time with life and you're not paying attention to the scare stuff that we're doing to you. Uh, so, so what happens is when young adults have kids, they go through a period of five to seven years where they really don't like to go out. No matter what they say, and no matter if they truly love their kid, they're really afraid to leave their kids with babysitters. They'll do it every now and then, but they minimize it. So we were losing customers who were customers of ours when they were your age, and they were coming to the movies, and they were great. You know, They were coming to, to the Eden and stuff, and then they would disappear for four or five years. Now they're back. And the other thing that's very devious is when we select the movies we're showing at, at the kids' matinee, is we show movies that their parents saw when they were their age. Okay? So you are basically satisfying an affection about a movie both ways. One, the kid is seeing it for the first time. Never-ending story. You know, wonderful movie. The parents are so goofy about that movie, the parents came to the movie dressed as the princess. <laughs> it was great. So one of the things that was very important to us is when I was a, a, a parent of a young kid, I would take him to the movies, and I would sit there as an adult and say, I can't believe I'm going to sit through this crap for two hours. A dinosaur is talking, <laughs> and I could care less. We give 
movies that the parents will enjoy either because they've had the experience, which is very good, and they want their kids to have the same experience as they did, or the movie works at two levels. So that's, that's what we've been doing at Enzian, is again, seeing the place from the viewer's point of view, from the customer's point of view, and in the child's uh, instance, from their point of view, will they come here and see magic and experience magic when now they're all conditioned to it when i when the movie starts and i show up they all start screaming because free stuff is coming that's what they call the raffle free stuff <laughs> and then they know they're going to get a movie that's really fun and while they're watching the movie which they can't do at regal they can order pizza they can order hot dogs and they can sit at a table and watch the movies and at the peanut butter matinee, you're allowed to talk at the, ca at the screen. You know, something that we've experienced here and there and we really don't like it as adults, they can talk to the screen. Uh, and at the end, they get balloons. Parents are using the kids' matinees for the kids to behave during the week or to be good at church. If you're good at church, you get to go to the kids' matinee. So this, 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 this aspect of going to the movies and experiencing magic is something that to this day exists, except you guys are getting to be too smart, too jaded to believe in magic, but you believe in Tom Cruise. You believe he's actually in a motorcycle. <laughs> you know, you believe that Ant-Man really exists. Guys, I hate to break it to you, but that's called magic, okay? <laughs> and you are experiencing the same mechanism that the kids do but they call it magic. You're drawn to these things. These things are enjoyable to you. Uh, and what I want to do is make sure that not only we're giving you movies that bring you magic, but that also you come to a place where there is a feeling of magic around you. And as an adult, Eden Bar is magic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a place where we have a, a menu uh, that's bigger than the food menu, and it's just beers. That's magic, okay? <laughs> Believe it or not, that's magic. A wine list that you can't find anywhere else in town, that's magic. And the ability for you to go to a movie theater uh, and make sure you get there an hour earlier because you're going to sit out at Eden Bar and eat or drink or whatever you're going to do, and then you're going to watch a movie, and then afterwards, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go back to Eden and argue about it. So that's consciously what we knew we had, and we wanted to massage it, and we wanted you to be aware that while you don't call it magic, that's exactly what you're getting when you go to Enzian. And we're re respectful of films. Uh, when we, we like to run classic movies. Uh, and here's something else that's very important. That was that, that, that technology that's happening, and we can weave it into the magic. Is that's the digital restoration? Nobody in town has 35 millimeter projectors anymore. We have one, and we use it one night a week for all. And they exist. Uh, the freaks who get a kick out of seeing a movie and knowing it's in 35 millimeter, even though it's just a projection. They don't see the projector, and it's all scratched up and lousy, and it looks like a fine. I'll give them that. But if you come see a classic movie, if you come see Casablanca on a big screen, it comes from a digital restoration. It looks as good as it did when it came out. Any movie that the kids are seeing, they're not old movies. They're seeing them as they're brand new. So we have the ability of even doing more magic and making all these things come to life. You know, I, I often sit there and I, and I think, everybody in this movie is dead. <laughs> Every single person in this movie has died, and they're alive. And not only are they alive, but I can see them thinking. I can look through their eyes, you know? Magic. Uh, and, 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 and a lot of you have or will develop this affection for movies you're seeing at this age. You know, when you're 60 years old, you have an affection to some of these movies that meant something to you, as I do. And whenever we run... An, to be honest with you, every film is like that with me. So when I introduce a movie that's like that, I really feel like I'm introducing an old friend, and all of you who came to watch the movie are like, yeah, you came to this party of, of this person who deserves to be honored. And that's the movie we're showing you, and you love it, and you have a great time. And 
One last thing. And uh, these days, all of you have movie collections. You have DVDs and you watch movies, and it, that's great. When I was in film school, if you had a movie collection, it was in 16 millimeter, and the movie itself weighed like 40 pounds. All right, and you had to have a 60 millimeter projector to see it, which made more noise than the speaker with the sound. So you can have a great movie collection and be as close to movies as you want. But one thing that you owe yourselves, and you should really, really be aware of this, and, and, and eventually this is going to become something that everybody's going to go after, is that you've never seen your favorite movie until you've seen it on a big screen. Whenever we show Casablanca, I always ask people, how many have seen Casablanca? You know, 200 people, their hands go up, right? How many have seen Casablanca on a big screen? One? That is the point. Isn't it great on a big screen? It's incredible. And, and, and people, you don't know this until you've actually seen it. You may have seen Casablanca a thousand times. When you see it on a big screen, it's a different movie. It, 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 it actually is better. And people who do that, they leave the theater like... They just saw a technical innovation. You know, wow, we've never seen this. Humphrey Bogart was great. Ingrid Bergman was great. Uh, and so all of these things that we do is to bring you magic that movies can do. I mean, don't forget, in the end, you ever see what a film strip looks like? It's a bunch of still pictures. How does it become something alive up on the big screen? Well, it does. And all of that is magic, and you'll call it different things, but at the beginning of your life and possibly at the end of your life, you're going to look back on an experience like you get at NZN and in your favorite movies, and you're going to remember that it was magic. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Henry. Well, it's over. <laughs> I talk too much. <laughs> Thank you. It's not quite over yet, because I want to open it up for questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> so we do have a few people in the room with microphones, and we'll take some time for questions, both from the audience and for those of you watching online. Feel free to chat in your questions. Would anyone like to start? I have like 20 more questions I could ask, but okay, let's start over on this side, and then we'll come over here. Yeah, yeah. He's right There's there with the, the microphone. The and go ahead and do us a favor and hold it. Pretty close to your mouth, please. Awesome. I'm Shane. Uh, I'm in computer animation. And uh, I'm a victim of nostalgia. Uh, so what you're saying is really inspiring. Uh, and I just want to know, how do you guys separate yourself from the MoCA Museum? From the what? The MoCA Museum in New York. How do we separate ourselves? Mm -hmm. Or the MoMA, excuse me. The MoCA's in Virginia. Oh, the MoMA. Yeah. The Museum of Modern Art. Well, w you know... Uh, it, it's interesting that you say this because I speak of Enzian as though this is so unique. There are places that give you that experience and that have tremendous respect for classic movies. Uh, so we don't. We're really all together. We are, there is an association of, of independent theaters uh, that do what we do. What we do that's different is what the, the, the context that we give you, the theater, We've had people come from all over the country, movie stars and stuff, and they're great. They're great. In Detroit, they have a great movie theater at, the, at, the, at the, the Detroit Museum. But this is very true. You can look around the whole country, and the combination of elements we give you at Enzian, the location, the, the, the greenery, the trees that are outside, the wonderful bar, wonderful food, the ability to have dinner while you're watching, all of those things, they don't exist anywhere else in the country. So we are, we are treated as special by people who come and visit us. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Let's go to this side. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Uh, hi. My name is Federico Carmona. I'm actually also from Venezuela. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the film production. I'm Faye. And the question that I have is, uh, in both an interview with the Orlando Business Journal and the Orlando Magazine, uh, you mentioned a comment that your mother told you when you were young. Yes. Um, and you said that she always told you to be where you want to be when luck hits you. Absolutely. Uh, my question is, <laughs> do you think it, it is really a matter of luck or a matter of following your guts and instinct? Because you say that your, the best decision in your life was not looking for a job right after college, Absolutely. but going to graduate school. So you do you know, think it's luck or it's following your instinct? In the end, you have to give luck the credit. And the credit you deserve 
is not being lucky in the real estate building business or in, you know, because you needed a job, you kind of figured, okay, I'll work in the daytime, you know, I'll be a plumber and, a, and, a, and, and to make enough money. Well, when luck hits you, you may end up owning a plumbing company. So luck is luck and it will hit you, but you have to be smart enough, which is what my mother taught me, that when luck hits you, it's going to send you in the direction you want to go. Luck is going to hit you. She's, she always was sure. You may be lucky your entire life, one piece of luck after another, or you may not be, but one time in your life, luck is going to come your way. And when it does, you want to be close to what you love and not close to something which will give you a livelihood, which will be a wonderful thing and, and, and sustain you for the rest of your life, but you're not with what you love. So it's not, it, no, it, you, you know, my mother, as you probably know, all Venezuelan mothers are very superstitious, okay? Uh, they, they, and they're also a fire hazard, okay? <laughs> and I'll tell you why. They're very Catholic and they have a candle lit for every one of their children who is not at home, okay? And it is terrifying the amount of fire that was going on next to my mother. But, and, and I am not uh, a believer in the supernatural and things like that. But you know what? I really bought the business about if, if you're near something you love when luck strikes you and you should attempt to be, it's, it's going to work out. And, and, it, and it did. And, and the credit that I deserve is not taking the job at Berlitz because I would be a very successful director of a Berlitz school and I didn't want to be that. So yes, make sure that you factor luck into your thinking. All right, we're going to kind of alternate over here. So come down. Uh, how's it going? My name is Alfredo. I'm actually from Mexico. Um, but um, I, I was going to ask you, I'm, I'm, I come from a film program, and I, I'm an aspiring producer. So uh, based on the fact that you have some experience on that field, what do you look for the most when you're looking for collaborators? What do you expect them, professionally speaking and creatively speaking, to be like? You know, the, the, the first thing, you, you mentioned the word collaborators. Okay? While you're going to school and learning your trade, the thing that will be the most valuable to you is your friends, okay? If you take a look at any filmmaker or any movement, literary movement or whatever, there was always a group of crazy people who hung around together and together they helped each other make it. And I think what, what you want out of your friends, especially now that you have the technology, you can make a movie tomorrow, edit it yourself, and what's most important is release it on the internet yourself, is to be around people that together they're going to be able to pull off what you want to do. That's very, very important. And, and what I look for in a producer, uh, and when I was hiring people like that, uh, I was looking for two things. This is a bad thing, but I'm always doing this. I'm always looking for the creative spirit. It's very important to me. But that other 50% of me that was responsible for the presidency, can this person pull it off? You run into a lot of creative people who in the end need a partner who's actually going to do the work. But I was only having the ability to hire one producer, so I was looking for someone who had the ability to be creative, but at the same time had the ability to do the work. Okay. I guess mine is not really into depth, but um, I noticed you were saying something pretty much about only having one location. Um, is that first and foremost true? Secondly, uh, if it is, would you or do you actually see yourself uh, expanding, see your company expanding, uh, having multiple locations, not only in America, but like maybe over in Venezuela or right. um, places around the world? You know, the thing about me is that I got suckered into the mythology, not totally a mythology, of a great company that had all those things. So I had the ability to have my influence and, and have my work uh, not only uh, work on the location where I was, but we had a station in, uh, in Texas, we had a sta two stations in Florida, a station in Detroit, we had a station in San Antonio. So the company was making available to me the ability that a person who starts their own business, as they become successful, pretty soon realizes 
you know, we got to start pulling the strings together. So I never had the fear or frustration that a young entrepreneur might have that unless we start making connections with other locations, our business, either someone will come up with the idea and take it from us, or it'll die from, from lack of good growth. So uh, I did have the ability to have more than one location. It is important, and it is something that eventually becomes something you have to consider. And you have to be very careful. Expansion doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to grow. There are many companies who decided to expand, and that was the reason they collapsed. Um, and then there are companies who don't understand what the hell's going on. Um, what, what was, the, what was the, the, the video company where you rented videos? Blockbuster. What the hell happened there? <laughs> Listen, I remember one day they came out of nowhere, then all of us, you know, they shut down every mom and pop that was the original rental places, and then they had their own TV shows, they were backing movies, and it seemed like two months later they were going broke. You have to, you know, you have to be careful that expansion work. And if you're going to do that, that you're smart enough to be a person of your times. They were not. You know how many people did not recognize what Netflix now knows? The TV networks don't recognize that. They think they're going to rule the world. The, no, not the networks, the TV stations. The networks are already talking about doing what, and they're doing it, what Netflix is doing. You know? So, so yes, it is very important that you think of that, but that you do it from a position of strength and knowledge and that you see things from the point of view of the customer. Does the customer really know what to do with this, or is it just me trying to rule the world? Mm -hmm. Let's go to our online students. We have some questions. We have a couple of questions from online. The first one comes from Gavin Brown in LA, who he says he loves your theater. It is amazing. <laughs> He wants to know what is the fastest way to get a job in the film industry, for example, as a PA? Well, here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is that it's not really very difficult to get a job in the film industry, okay? Uh, it's very difficult to get a job that pays you in the film industry. There are so many independent films being produced, just, just in, in Orlando alone, okay? You could get a job as a PA, you could get a job as, 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 as a whole bunch of things, where people are producing really, really good movies that don't necessarily have enough money. There are people in this town making delightful, great films for like $20,000, $10,000. That's the benefit, and what I would suggest to anybody who's starting out is please do that. You never know when this film director is putting together a Blair Witch Project or when this director is putting together paranormal activity, he's now in what, in his like sixth or seventh movie and they're all making millions of dollars. He shot his first film in his apartment. Blair Witch was shot with video cameras because they couldn't afford 16 millimeter and it was the use of the video cameras that made the movie what it was. So right now, at your age, you can afford to be hungry, a little bit, okay? Work for nothing in stuff that you believe in, okay? Because that's how you're gonna get places. The person who's sitting around waiting for a salary or they're really ripping me off, you know what, they're gonna sit around forever. And the person who gets involved with a couple of movies with some very bright people and they collaborate, they're, put, they're making an investment in their future. So what I would suggest is you can't get them, it's not easy to get a job, a paying job in film unless you have experience and all that kind of stuff. So go out and work with people who have no money, who are making a good movie, and take a chance that that movie will take you where you want to go. You also touched on how you fell into editing and how much of it you've done since then. Jeremiah from DeLand asks, at what point would you stop trying to improve a project? What is your gauge for saying this is good enough? If I keep working on it to improve it, I will ruin it. That's a very important point. Very, very important. And I live in DeLand, too, so maybe we'll run each other at the Boston Coffee House. Well, that works out, because the second question was, if I saw you at Starbucks in DeLand, would you shoot me away if I came to talk okay. to you about films? <laughs> then, I'm not, then I'm not sure this guy's from DeLand, because we have no Starbucks in DeLand. <laughs> But we have the Boston Coffee House, if you see me there. Okay, <laughs> he, this is a very important point. 
you have to keep, it's like that, that, that Woody Allen thing about relationships are like sharks, you know? You have to keep moving or they die. You have to keep making movies. Do not get hung up on a movie that you keep re-editing and re-editing and re I know someone who made a film six years ago. They're still re-editing the film. Get it done, get it to the point where you go, that's it, we're gonna distribute it and then I'm moving on. By, by this point, that person should have made five other movies. You have to get to the point where you go, it's over. Do not spend your whole life thinking that this movie that you love so much is going to be your defining work of art. It's not. Do it, get it done, walk away from it, and then put it on YouTube, do whatever you're going to do with it. Do not spend the rest of your life re-editing the same film. What you want to do is you, what you learn on this movie, as opposed to applying it to this movie, you apply it to the next movie. And what you learn on that one, you apply to the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. And before five years are up, you'll have five, six films in your pocket. Well, she's still re-editing the same film that no matter, no matter if they re-edited like, like geniuses, it's not that interesting. But as a first film, it's fine. So that's a very important point. I can't tell you when the time comes, but make sure that you have that moment in time where you go, it's over, I'm starting another one next week, this one is going wherever the hell it's going. Do not get trapped by people. I know people who are still rewriting their film, they haven't even shot it, and it's been years. Don't get caught up in that. What, what you wanna do is apply what you learn to the next project, because as you're going into the next project, you can shoot it with that in mind. The one you shot, you can't reshoot it. Well, you, some of them are reshooting them. Uh, don't do that. Just on the one hand, really love your movie. Uh, spend as much energy, as hard as you have in that movie. And at some point, like a kid, when that kid turns 18, you let him go. And that's it. From then on, they have their own life. Movies are like that. Don't get caught up in re-editing, reworking, rethinking the same movie and over, over and over. It's very possible that you made the mistake you think you can fix. Don't fix it. Put the movie out, fix, a, fix that issue in your next movie. But keep making movies because if you keep re-editing the same film over and over again, rewriting the, you know, all you're doing is just rehashing old trash. Let it go. All right, I think we have time for another back here. Wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to you. You've been had your hand okay. up right from the start. But after we we'll, do this one. We'll do two more questions, okay? And then I'll give you guys a little bit of time at the end if you want to come up and ask any individual questions. Hi, my name is Anthony. I'm from Detroit. Uh, Yay, film I here. love Detroit. <laughs> 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 yeah, I just wanted to know, uh, we just talked about finishing a project, but I know you mentioned before the jitters and the troubles of starting the project. What, are, what is your process? What do you tell yourself? right before you decide to start the project without being forced into it with time constraints? Don't think. Just go do it. Okay? It ain't going to kill you. Okay? And the sooner you get it over with, the sooner you have a success or you have a failure. Just, if you got all the pieces, you got a script, you got your cameras, you know, obviously, let's, just, let's assume you have all those pieces in place. Just get, you know, you get, it's very important if it's a, if it's a, if it's a dramatic movie, if, it, if it's a narrative, believe in your script and then follow your script. What will happen, just like in editing, as you start, you will be following the road that you mapped out, and as you get into it, you'll start understanding, and the film, the actors, the plot will tell you things, and you'll start to deviate this from the script as you, you communicate with the film. But this business, and I'm really at fault sometimes, of just waiting until you feel the time is right, it's never going to be right. It's never, ever, ever going to feel like it's right because the insecurity that you have, you will always have, and you have to be able to walk into a theater, you know, scared to death, and sing your song and believe in your material even though you're scared to death. Go do it. Get it over with. It's either going to be a success or a failure. If it's a failure, it's what we call a learning experience. No big deal. Move on, move on, move on. Have confidence in yourself. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, hi, my name is Byron Miller. I'm from the Creative Writing for Bachelors. Um, 
I'm a huge fan of the NZ, and I go there on like a monthly basis with my daughters. Uh, my question to you would be, if you would mind speaking on how the Indian supports the local filmmaker as it does, because I've seen a few films um, shot there right. that students from Full Sail have made, but through this conversation, I haven't really heard it come up yet, but I want to make sure that that's get put out so the filmmakers at Full Sail know if they have a home in Indian. Okay. We, um, we do something every month called Film Slam. I don't know if you know what that is. Okay, Film Slam is a, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a, an independent, uh, sometimes we could say it's even more student-based, but this is uh, once a month, we run films produced in the area with the filmmakers there, and the filmmakers meet the filmmakers, we see the films, they have it every month, and then at the end of the year, we have something called brouhaha, where we show some of those films, those films then, uh, four or five of them get selected and they appear in the Florida Film Festival. So that's something that we do. Uh, if we go back, the, the, the people who made uh, Blair Witch Project, they worked at Enzian. They were volunteers and one of them was in charge of the film festival. Uh, and the first time that uh, that movie ever got shown was at Enzian and it was like three hours long. <laughs> and they cut it down to an hour and a half and you know, and, and the, the rest is history. So we're, we, we not only do we do things, uh, and the, 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 uh, constantly we're screening movies off hours because the filmmaker wants to have a, uh, a session where they're testing it on people. We'll do that, you know, if we can at, 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 at no cost, you know. Uh, so, so we're very, very close to the filmmaking community. The filmmaking community is very close to us because not only are we, you know, very close to them, they, we show the kind of movies that they want to see. But I'll tell you what we, we need. And this is looking at all of you. I don't have enough of you guys coming to Enzian and watching movies. I don't know if it's too far or you're too busy, but it's something that I'm constantly discussing. What do I need to get you at Enzian? Because when I was going to film school in Boston, there was a movie theater, an independent movie theater called the Orson Welles. And that's where we all hung out. I mean, whether we were going to the movies or not, that's where we were talking crap, we were talking movies, you know, we were trashing whatever movie we wanted to see. A lot of uh, uh, big filmmakers would come and have special screenings there, and it was, it was a terrific hangout. This business about camaraderie, uh, being part of a group and you all grow up into the industry together, it's very important and very real, and trust me, you can go to uh, you know, the Algonquin and all the writers in the 30s, used to, there was always a group of people who all sort of came up together. That's true of films. If you talk, if you talk to, to, you know, like Steve Jobs and those people, you know, they all had a group in a garage. Uh, if you talk to Spielberg, uh, you know, he'll talk about his group. Uh, Coppola will talk about American International and all the Roger Corman films that they did with, uh, who is it, Jack Nicholson, uh, Coppola, the group is very important, and I would love for Enzian to be the place that you call home when you do that. There's a, there's a student among you, Kyle Bailey. Are you here? Okay. okay. You know what Kyle does? He doesn't have a car. He walks to Enzian. Okay? Sometimes he'll catch the bus. Sometimes he's at a midnight movie and he has to walk. It's like a two-hour walk for him. All right? And he doesn't think twice. I mean, I'm at the film festival, and there he is. And, and then I ask him, how did you get here? So, well, I walked. Uh, you know, that, that, that's an excessive uh, affection that I so much appreciate. But a little bit from you guys, come over. You'll really, you'll really like the atmosphere at Enzian. Uh, and, and, and come to Film Slam. Look, look go to enzian.org, uh, because you, you need to meet people who are making movies and you need to work on their movies, they need to work in your movies, and eventually, you know, there'll be a group like, you know, Spielberg and all, except Enzian was your hangout, as is the truth about the Blair Witch guys. Enzian was their hangout. So come by. You know, if you see me there, bop me in the head, you know, I'll buy you whatever <laughs> is legal at your age. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take about 15 minutes. If anybody does want to come and chat with Henry, we'll hang out up here. But we want to go ahead and just thank Henry so much for being here with us today. Well, I, I, am, I am very grateful that you listened to what I had to say. I, again, have to tell you, I don't know what I'm talking about. But for purposes of this drama, I had to pretend that I did. 
Uh, and you are in a very, very lucky place to learn what you're doing because you have to learn your craft. But what you have to remember in the end, it's what you put into it. Uh, you can come to a place like this and it's not going to get you a job, but it's going to teach you how to make movies and it's going to put you in touch with other people who have the same desire. So best of luck. We're at Enzian. I'm at Enzian. If there's anything I can do for you, uh, trust me, I, I, I'm there. Uh, and bring your friends. Thank you all for Thank coming. You. Have a great afternoon.